the latest twist in the will they, won't they story that everyone is talking about. Elon Musk and Twitter. It's the hottest and messiest relationship drama this side of Riverdale, and it looks like after weeks of flirtation and fighting, the new couple has officially done the deed. Now it is official, Elon Musk has bought Twitter for approximately 44 billion. He's gonna be paying each share of Twitter $54.20. In a statement released by the company, Mr. Musk said, free speech is the bedrock of a functioning democracy and Twitter is the digital town square where matters vital to the future of humanity are debated. This is a dramatic turn of events from earlier this month when Twitter was set to decline Musk's offer, adopting a so-called poison pill to block him. That's right, people. Twitter said it would never sell to Elon Musk, and then he produced the cash, and they're like, all right, we'll sell. <laughs> yes, I guess they found that edit button after all. <laughs> it's actually kind of a historic moment. This is the first time anyone at Twitter has changed their mind about anything. Well done. <laughs> I feel like Twitter was always gonna sell to Elon though, right? They just couldn't be too eager about it. You know, it's like a, like a husband and a wife where it's like, uh-uh, I am not going to that wedding. Forget it, it's not gonna happen. And then three months later, it's like, how does my bow tie look? How does it, <laughs> do you think it looks good? Do you think it does? I honestly don't know why Elon would wanna own Twitter, right? It just doesn't seem like a fun place to supervise right now. You know, it's like buying Jurassic Park after the power went down and the cages are opened. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna spend a lot of time replacing Jeep windshields. That's all I'm saying. But the truth is, look, in many ways, this is a really smart move by Elon Musk, because wealthy men know the value in owning publishing platforms. Yeah, it's why Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post. It's why Rupert Murdoch bought the Wall Street Journal. It's why Confucius owns those fortune cookies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because you see, then he knows that none of us will play his lucky numbers in the lotto. That's genius. <laughs> so you see, by buying Twitter, Elon Musk gets to own one of the most culturally influential publishing platforms in the world. I mean, remember this, think about it. Twitter is how the Arab Spring took off, right? Black Lives Matter blew up on Twitter. The Me Too movement started on Twitter. Trump used Twitter to turn himself from a reality show joke into the 45th president of the United States and a joke. <laughs> so owning Twitter gives you more power than the drugstore employee with the key to the deodorant shelf, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you wanna smell fresh, you best not piss off Curtis. Don't play around. <laughs> I'll shut you down, walk around smelling musty. So here's the thing, look, whether you are for Elon Musk or against him, you've gotta admit, it is pretty crazy that one man is now in control of all of that. Because before this, Jack Dorsey didn't own Twitter. A lot of people think he did. No, he had 2% of the shares, and even as CEO, he still had to answer to the board, and the board still had to answer to the shareholders, and Twitter itself still had to answer to the SEC, but now as a private company, it's just Elon Musk. Yeah, everything that happens on Twitter from now on is up to him and also whatever strain his weed guy gives him that day. <laughs> I'm just saying, if he gets the wrong sativa, there could be a race war, people. Prepare yourselves. <laughs> like, this is the thing. Wh whether it's a billionaire you like or a billionaire you hate, as a society, I think we should spend more time interrogating how easy it is for billionaires to shape our world in their favor. Just think about it. You like it now, you don't like it now, but should they be able to do it? I don't know. But let's move on from Twitter to a real battlefield, the invasion of Ukraine. Since before the invasion began, the United States has tried to put pressure on Russia using economic sanctions, which is basically taking away your allowance, but for countries. And the US government has cast a wide net. It's gone after Russian officials, uh, oligarchs, companies, banks, and of course, Vladimir Putin himself. But it turns out there's one high profile Russian who has somehow avoided becoming a target. A new report explains why the US has so far refused to sanction Vladimir Putin's girlfriend and the mother allegedly of his three or three of his children. The US government has considered, but then pulled back on sanctioning a woman long rumored to be Putin's girlfriend, the Russian gymnast, Alina Kabeva. This is something that uh, was deemed so sensitive that they decided to hold off because they believe that Putin's uh, response could be so irrational, so angry, um, that there would be some sort of backlash. Wow, this is interesting. <laughs> no, the US government has sanctioned everyone except Putin's girlfriend? I guess they watched the Oscars and they were like, ooh, maybe we should stay away from spouses. <laughs> just, uh, just play it safe. And, and, and before we get into the sanctions or not sanctions, am I the only person who's shocked that Vladimir Putin has a girlfriend? Am I the only one? <laughs> like, if there's any man out there 
who has some red flags. Girl, let me tell you about Vlad. <laughs> yeah, I know some people like a bad boy, but this is next level. <laughs> like, there's bad and then there's genocide, okay? <laughs> also, Putin must be relieved that the US is not sanctioning his girlfriend. Because let's be honest, sanctions take a relationship to a whole new level. You know, that puts a lot of pressure on the relationship. Yeah, I always tell my friends, sanctions in a relationship, whoa, oh yeah, it's a lot of pressure, mm -mm. yeah. Yeah, I'm sure Putin was relieved. You know, he can't have America being more serious about his relationship than he is. <laughs> Can you imagine how pissed his girlfriend would be? He's just like, Vladdy, how come America treat me like your wife, but you still will not let me keep toothbrush at Kremlin, huh? <laughs> ti što, Vlad, ti što. <laughs> and finally, let's move on to some entertainment news. You probably know Netflix as the service with great shows that get canceled just when you become a fan. <laughs> and also the home of the saddest episodes of Arrested Development ever. <laughs> but right now, some of Netflix's biggest hits are actually imports from other countries. And one of the hottest series on Netflix right now is a reality show that is beloved in Japan, but has Americans a lot more divided. Japanese game shows have never been known for their subtlety, but one new offering on Netflix has jaws dropping. Old Enough is an unscripted series, parents sending their two to five-year-old children to run errands, from grocery shopping to dropping off dry cleaning or squeezing fresh juice. Netflix calling Old Enough the most wholesome show you've ever seen. But the internet isn't convinced. Um, how is abandoning a tiny child to cross a busy road wholesome? It gave me anxiety. Sure, it was cute, but I'm not sure that's great parenting. And while the concept might seem bizarre to Western audiences, the show has been running for 30 seasons in Japan. Japan is very different than the U.S. Neighborhoods are more pedestrian friendly, and the culture is more trusting of kids. In Japan, parents chaperone their 10 and 11-year-olds on just 15% of trips, compared with 65% here. Some parenting experts think American audiences can learn from the show. It's a little nerve-wracking to let your kids go, but when you do, they will just impress you. Or they'll disappoint you. <laughs> there should always be an or. But yeah, one of Netflix's most popular shows, and easily one of my favorites, is Old Enough, which is all about kids doing things for themselves. And let's be honest, I mean, that's the best kind of kid, you know? It's like having a self-cleaning oven, but it's a child. <laughs> And I agree, I absolutely agree that kids should have more freedom than they do. This American obsession with protecting kids can actually mess with their heads. Like, think about it, parents in America will leash their kids, but then let their dogs run around free. <laughs> your kids should never look at your pets and be like, that lucky bastard. <laughs> I don't care what anyone says, man, American parents are overbearing. You won't let your kids walk down the street by themselves, but then inside the house, they just hand them an iPad and ignore them the whole day, huh? Just be like, Mommy, will you reach me? No, 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 shh, not now. I'm tweeting about how bad these Japanese parents are. Go on, here, here, take the iPad. <laughs> go on YouTube and learn about who really did 9-11. Go on, go on. <laughs> I don't get the anxiety people feel watching the show. Yes, these kids are running errands. Yes, but guys, there's a whole camera crew nearby. They're like, they're by themselves. No, there's a camera crew. If something was about to happen that was bad, they'd step in. You know, it's not like a nature documentary where they have to stand by and let the tiger kill the gazelle. <laughs> and now the windowless van approaches <laughs> and absconds with little Mikey <laughs> as the sun sets on Main Street. <laughs> the circle of life is complete. <laughs> All right, that's it for the headlines. <laughs> Before we go to a break, let's check in on the stock market with our very own finance expert, Michael Costa, everybody. <laughs> Things are looking crazy, Michael. Yeah. What is happening with the market today? Well, I am absolutely crushing the market, okay? Uh, as, and I, as you're and, saying. And, and I got a hot tip for you, and I got a hot tip for you, so let's get into it. Okay. Actually, actually, before I do that, the Japanese game show. Yeah. I mean, that's unreal. Right? You know, I mean, I know American adult children who can't execute those tasks. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, but, but parents, you gotta be careful sending your kids out to do errands. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, and, and my dad asked my 25-year-old sister to go get the family orange juice. She drove to Mexico and joined a cult. You know what I mean? <laughs> Which reminds me, Christy, if you're watching this, uh, <laughs> we still need orange juice back at the house. So, look, I'm... Okay. 
Trevor, I'm I'm so thankful this show takes place in Japan. Yeah. You know, so imagine a place like South Africa where the kids would have to watch out for all the giraffe in the street or. No, um, no, 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 Costa, Costa, no. We have giraffes, but we don't have them in the streets. Because you don't have streets. <laughs> dude, don't be ashamed. You're doing good. I'm dude, not ashamed. That's dude, what. You're doing you, good. Dude, you you're know, doing good. Okay. Look, look, maybe the reason I'm not impressed with these Japanese kids is that as a kid myself, I spent a lot of alone time. So. Look, look, my dad, he used to take me camping, and, and, and as I was setting up the campsite, he would, he would drive off, and he'd say, I'll be back in a few minutes, and, you know, it, it would be a couple days, usually, and sometimes <laughs> I'd be up there on the mountain, and it would start to get cold, and I wouldn't have a lot of drinking water, so I would, I would warm the snow with my hands, and then eventually I would, I, would, I would pack up the stuff, and I would start the long trek home, you know, through the, the winding, unforgiving mountains, and... Eventually, I would bust through the door of home, and my mom, she'd be so happy to see me. She'd be crying, and she'd be embracing me, and my dad, he'd be so surprised, he'd be screaming, you know? <laughs> Anyways, I love camping. And then, and then the next time he would take me, we would drive even further away from the house. But, but, but I remember, as I, would, as I would trek through the mountains and, and hunt antelope with my bare hands, the, <laughs> the one thought that would get me through all this, Trevor, was, was my mom's warm embrace and her sweet smile. I think... So you want to get to the markets real quick, or...? Um, the yeah. markets are bad, Trevor. Yeah. The markets are bad, OK? Red is bad, red is bad, red is bad, all right? Oh, okay. Now, okay. these lines, you got to ignore these, unfortunately. Uh, my apologies. I uploaded all my computer data into my financial app. These are really just personal stuff that measures on my computer. This, this is my salary once I passed it through inflation. Uh, the green line are all my Twitter followers once I talk about race relations in the United States. Uh, the green are my effectiveness of erections as I grow older. It's, it's an odd thing to measure, but I did agree to Apple's terms and conditions. So, look, look, here's my hot tip. Here's my hot tip. Bonds, okay? As this is showing red, invest in bonds. Michael Costa, financial expert, believes in bonds, wow. especially the bond between a mother and her son. Because as I'm gnawing on a coyote carcass, it's the only vision that gets me home safe. And also, when I lose my money in the stock market, it's that bond I can rely on for a couple extra bucks. So, that's <laughs> I think you were abandoned. Michael, um, thank you so much for that.